I remember the first time I ever shared my personal story, my conversion story, as a priest. I was in Pensacola, Florida, I believe. Yeah, that was the first time. And when I finished it, there was a great reaction from the people, and uh, an elderly Monsignor walked up, and he was shaking his head. And he said, young man, I was young then, uh, he said, young man, that, that, that's a tremendous story, that's a great story, but is it true? <laughs> and I said, oh, Monsignor, uh, even I couldn't make up something like that, and I surely couldn't. Uh, to this day, it kind of boggles my own mind, uh, the goodness of God, and how far he can bring a soul when he wants to. I've done it many times since, and with each passing year, uh, I come to appreciate a little bit more uh, the goodness, the great goodness of God. You know, God's very name is mercy. God's name is mercy. He is mercy. He doesn't just have mercy. God is mercy itself. Let me just begin by reading to you from my favorite book, from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 15. You know, chapter 15, Gospel of Luke, is a tremendous, you, you might call it the Magna Carta of mercy. It's a tremendous chapter in the Gospels on God's mercy. The tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, at which the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus launches into a few parables, trying to explain to us the nature of our Heavenly Father. I'll just use one of these parables to illustrate. Jesus said to them, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. So the father divided up the property. Some days later, this younger son collected all his belongings and went off to a distant land where he squandered his money on dissolute living. After he had spent everything, a great famine broke out in that country, and soon enough he was in dire need. He attached himself to one of the property class of that place who sent him to the farm to take care of the pigs. He longed to fill his belly with the food which the pigs ate, but no one made a move to give him anything. Coming to his senses at last, he said, how many hired hands at my father's place have more than enough to eat while I perish from hunger. I know I will break away and return to my father. I will say to my father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. With that, he set off for his father's house. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was deeply moved. He ran out to meet him, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Take the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, and now 
he is found. At one time or another, in one way or another, to some degree or another, every one of us is the prodigal son or daughter. Uh, every one of us at one time or another, to some degree or another, squanders that legacy of grace we have received from our Heavenly Father. And Jesus, in this beautiful parable, assures us of the nature of God our Father. Over the years, now I celebrated my 10th anniversary last year of ordination to the priesthood, but in that 10 years that I've been preaching, I've traveled many places. Actually, it's only in the last seven years. I've preached in 49 states and all of the Canadian provinces except Newfoundland, and I've been invited there many times, and I'm going to go sooner or later. I've preached in several foreign countries. So in that seven years or so, I've gotten around a little bit. And I've seen quite a cross-section of the church and the world. And I can tell you, with each passing year, I begin to see the great wisdom of God, and I marvel at it. Uh, I begin to see that God had a plan for me, just like he has a plan for every one of us. In that time, I have seen an awful lot. Some of it, perhaps I'd rather not have seen. I have stood on a bridge high above a river on a cold, dark night, one time with a 14-year-old girl. The police had it cordoned off. 14. She was about to jump. 14 from a rather affluent family. 14. And had been a heroin addict for three years. 14. And had been a prostitute for three years. In the course of that last 10 years that I've ministered as a priest and shared my own conversion story, I have received other telephone calls in the darkness of the night. Telephone call ringing and rattling in the middle of the night can be a frightening thing. I remember picking it up one early morning and didn't recognize the voice on the other end and said, you've got to come quickly, Father so-and-so is at such and such a place. And so I went. It was in a city I was unfamiliar with, but because of my past, I know cities. And it doesn't take me long to find anything, if I want to or have to. And so I found the address, and I recognized the place. I was not in my priest garb, as I usually am, because I recognized the nature of the mission from that emissary in the night. I got into the crack house. And I picked Father up off the floor, half dead. And I began to carry him out. Someone put a, port a 45 in my face. It had been a long time since I had a gun in my face. And when this happened, I was closer to old than young. Now, when I was young, I would have done one thing. Now that I was old, I did the same thing. 
I explained to him what I would do with the gun if he didn't take it out of my face. <laughs> and I carried Father out the door and brought him to a hospital. Another telephone call in the middle of the night. This one, also a woman's voice, but one I knew. That voice took me back 20 years. It was the voice of a young woman I had known in the bad old days when I had lived in Los Angeles, when I had sought my fortune as a relatively poor boy, grown up in a rough area of New York, went off to seek my fortune, ended up in Beverly Hills and Hollywood. And that voice took me back to those days. I vaguely recognized it and she identified herself and I couldn't hardly believe it. Well, I had seen her a couple years before, but I hadn't seen her for 15 years plus before that. Every one of us, every one of us has hopes and dreams and aspirations. Every one of us starts out in life filled with hope. Every one of us starts out in life with the seeds of greatness within our very being, every human being. And then the world, through its rejection, its cynicism, tends to beat that out of us. We begin to lose hope. See, over the years, I have come to learn that what matters is hope. You can lose everything else, but don't lose hope. In the last 10 years, I have seen people lose hope. That priest had lost hope. He, had, he wasn't a bad man. He had been rejected by his brethren. His only sin had been that he was trying to be a good priest. You know something? The world tends towards mediocrity. And if you try to rise above the mediocrity, the world will try to drag you down to its own level. Any man or woman who rises to greatness or aspires to it will experience rejection and opposition. That's a law woven into the very fabric of our existence. Well, that priest had lost hope. That little girl on the bridge had lost hope. Countless people that I have met in the last 10 years or so were losing hope or had lost hope. Long ago, it seems like an eternity ago, I can remember the exact moment where I was probably seven years old or so. I had just come from church with my family. I, and I was fortunate, I grew up in a good Catholic family. And we, of course, went to church every Sunday. We went to devotions at the local parish. I went to a Catholic school, had beautiful sisters to teach me when I was a young boy. So I had many, many benefits that the other people just never had. But I remember this specific time, I know it was in the month of May. I know it was in the month of May because the lilacs were in bloom in upstate New York. We came home, it was still daylight, having prayed the rosary at church. And I went in my grandparents' backyard. They live right across the street from us. And I was there alone. Couldn't have been more than seven or seven, eight years old. And I was at peace with the whole world. And I was smelling the lilacs in the backyard. My grandmother's yard was filled with big lilac bushes. And they were fully in bloom, at peace with the world. And all of a sudden, there was a woman there. Kind of startled me. But that was not unusual 
my grandparents lived in a very large four-family home. Um, my grandmother's brothers and sisters, some of them each had one of the four apartments. And there were people coming and going all the time. It was a very busy place in the days when families all used to live together. You remember that when, when some of us were younger? You remember when families all stayed together? On Sunday, you'd gather. We all gathered at my grandmother's house. That, that was the place we gathered. But families seemed to be much closer in those days. So seeing a strange person in my grandparents' backyard, that was not odd, but it did take me back a little bit. I was startled. But the beautiful young lady, she smiled at me. And I'll never forget it. She said one word. One word is all she said, my name, and what they used to call me in those days, Johnny. And I was embarrassed. When I, I was probably the most shy, introverted kid in history. And I was very embarrassed, and I kind of turned away, and when I looked back, she was gone. I thought maybe went into Aunt Mary's house. Never thought another thing about it for, mm, it must be, let's see, 32 years, 33 years. Never thought about that incident ever in my life until much later. Well, it must have been shortly after that incident. I remember another moment in time. You, ha you remember some of those moments in your life, some of them that stand out when you can remember those incidents out of a billion others, they're important. For whatever reason, they're important. I have forgotten most of my life. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> Some of it I wouldn't want to remember. But I, I, I remember certain things like it was yesterday. They're just like... They're, they're, they're important. There's something about them. Well, I remember one, it was winter, and I remember thinking something special about me, something different about me. I don't know what it is, but I know that I'm special. Now, by the way, I'm not. Uh, every one of us is, okay? But I was having a little boy's intuition here that I, I was unique. Now, the fact of the matter is, you are unique. Every one of us is unique. We are unique, precious, and unrepeatable. I mean, if fingerprints are all different, and they are, and if snowflakes are all different, and they are, persons, people, individuals are so different. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas once taught on the angels. He wrote a very uh, famous, uh, theological treatise on the angels. He called it his treatise on separated substances. Uh, that way he was referring to angels. And, and what he was based on, his thesis was, he was talking all about angels, that every angel is so different from every other angel as to constitute a separate species unto itself. That's how different. The angels are. Now, we're not angels, but we are very high in the hierarchy of being. Every one of us is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. And you can't lose sight of that. And if you have allowed the cynicism and rejection of the world to beat that out of you, take back what's yours, because you are indeed special. But before you let, don't let that go to your head. Because <laughs> the reason you're special is because of God. Well, I had that intuition. And I, I really had a desire in that moment to make my parents proud of me. I wanted, especially my mother and my father. My father was a hard man. Now, my dad passed away this year. You know, I, I don't know if you all know, I buried my dad September 11th. And the son, I buried my father September 11th. It didn't have anything to do with the tragedies that took place that day. His funeral was September 11th. I, I uh, flew down to Los Angeles for the funeral. To, I was going to be the one celebrating the um, funeral uh, rites. Uh, my uh, lady, my office manager who runs my office, called me up early in the morning, said, turn on the television, and the rest is history. But I buried my dad September 11th. 
And my dad was a hard man. Now, in his old age, he mellowed out, as we say. But when he was young, he was a hard man, not altogether what he should have been as a husband and a father. But he taught me something. Uh, he, my dad was an athlete, a very good one. He was an excellent athlete. He was one of those extremely physical guys. Now, he was known for being tough. He played a lot of sports, but he was a boxer. And the one thing he taught me, the one thing, maybe the only thing I can recall that he ever taught me, he probably taught me more than one thing, but the only thing I recall that he really got into my head, don't you dare quit. Don't you dare lay down and quit. Don't you ever throw the fight. And I don't care how bad you're getting beat. Don't you dare lay down on me and quit. And my father was so serious about that, that that is, the, that must, that just, it really, I interiorized that and carried it with me for the rest of my life, although I never thought about it specifically. Well, time went on and I tried to excel in different things, and I had to overcome some handicaps. The biggest handicap I had, and this is the truth, now don't laugh when I say this. Now. The biggest handicap I had to overcome, I was so introverted and shy, I couldn't open my mouth in front of anybody. I would hide. When I had to go to school, I would literally hide so I didn't have to go, especially if I knew I had to recite a lesson or something in school. I was so frightened of that. And a lot of other things. Probably a psychiatrist would have a wonderful time with me. <laughs> well, sports presented itself as the um, the thing that would get me out of the, the rut, like, like many of the boys in my neighborhood, and it was kind of a rough neighborhood, like I said, was the old part of town, downtown. And athletics uh, was a way out for a lot of us. And so I began, although I have to say until I was 12, I was too scared to get serious about it. And then when I had just turned 12, my mother brought me up to the local play playground. They had a, every summer, they had a series, they had a playground director and they had different things uh, that you could do, sports and games. And the uh, playground director that summer was an all-American end on the Boston College uh, football team. And he was uh, one of my better friend's big brother. And my mother dragged me up there by the ear and told that man, she said, now, th my son, is so afraid to do anything, he is so introverted, he is so timid and scared, uh, do something with him, would you? <laughs> he was a very kind man. He was an African-American man, about six foot four, 250 pounds. And he said, well, he said, um, how about I show you how to do a push-up? And then he began to show me these different, well, then he taught me how to box. And uh, his younger brother, who was a good friend of mine, uh, we, we became the best boxers around. I trained in the same gym that one day Mike Tyson would train in, in Catskill, New York, where he started. In any event, I began to develop self-confidence, and I thought, maybe this is it. Maybe this is my way to greatness. And I had great hope. Hope is a wonderful thing when you have it in your heart. I went almost all the way in the Golden Gloves, but I didn't, I did not win. There is always somebody bigger, faster, stronger, sooner or later. Well, my hopes were dashed. Funny thing, when you hope in something created, you set yourself up for disappointment. Time went on, I finished high school, the Vietnam War came. I always loved the military. I just, uh, have, I've just come from a conference last weekend in Virginia. I was in Woodbridge, Virginia last weekend. It's very close to Washington, D.C. 
It was a very successful conference, a great uh, number of military people there. Actually, there were even admirals and some, a couple generals there. And um, I always liked the military. And so I enlisted in the Army at the age of 18. I had a medical deferment back then in the days of the draft. I had a 4F deferment because of a football injury to my shoulder. And that was like a prized possession in those days. Man. I mean, people would have paid $100,000 or more for a 4F deferment if they'd have had it. Well, I didn't want to get out. I, I enlisted in the Army after rigorous training with the, the equivalent of a physical or personal trainer, you'd call it today. I didn't pay this guy. He was just a friend. And I got in and enlisted with a, an enlistment commitment for the Special Forces. And having uh, love, I, I love the idea of the military. Now, you know, from when I was a little boy, I do not ever remember playing anything when I was a boy. I never played anything other than soldier. My favorite toys were guns. Now, I'm, going to, I'm telling you all these things. A lot of you don't know me. They say, what that kind of priest is this? <laughs> I only liked violent sports, football and boxing, and I only played soldier. Matter of fact, when I was seven, eight years old, I remember the only prayer that I ever remember in my life, spontaneous prayer. I remember a little boy, I knelt down to say my prayers before I went to sleep, and I said, oh Lord, please do not let me die like other men, in bed, <laughs> sick, old. I want to go with my boots on. I'd seen me some cowboy movies. <laughs> And either, you know, cowboy or soldier, but with my boots on in a blaze of glory. Watch out what you ask for. <laughs> anyway, I enlisted in the Army, went through all that training. It was in the South. I, I went in in April. And you know what? When you go in the Army in April, you know what's coming? Summer <laughs> in the South. Hot, humid. I first went to South Carolina. Then I went to Alabama, and then I went to Georgia, and then I went to North Carolina. I ate more red dirt in the South. Oh, I remember it. With each succeeding stage of training, it got harder and harder. Didn't get easier, it got harder. They turned up the heat. Forced marches, 30 miles a day through the swamp, full pack, gun. Come in 10, 11 o'clock at night, exhausted, five minutes to eat. And you had to do 25 pull-ups before you got in the mess hall. I remember the last two weeks of my training, E and E, when I said that all the Army people where I was by Washington, D.C. last weekend, they all kind of, I, I saw the expressions, they all knew what it was, E and E, escape and evasion. Last two weeks, night jump, parachute jump, into the Okefenokee Swamp. That's the largest swamp in the United States. Wonderful. <laughs> I really liked it. I have always had more zeal than brains. <laughs> and then we parachuted into the darkness and landed in a swamp full of alligators and poisonous snakes. We had a topographical map, a compass, a survival knife, length of fishing line with a hook, and we had to go alone, not in groups, alone. And they had a battalion of rangers hunting us, and you didn't want to get caught. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I had always loved the outdoors. I had a big advantage. I wasn't scared of anything out there. And, uh, you know, you, you got to survive for two weeks. So well, how would you do that? I was talking to a retired a lady who was a retired Navy captain. I met her last week, and, and she was a pilot and, uh, in the Navy. And she had, uh, she had gone through survival school and so forth. And, and we were comparing notes and laughing. And, but it was wonderful. I, I just, you know, slogging through the swamp, uh, trying to keep from getting caught, trying to stay alive. Uh, you ever eat a snake? Raw? <laughs> 
You all haven't lived. <laughs> well, I got through that and I went through it and I loved it. Man, I can remember the sound of crying in the barracks at night. Now, this was the days of the draft. A lot of those boys didn't want to be there. Uh, they had left their families for the first time. Now, I've left my family for the first time, too. But I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there. A lot of them didn't want to be there. And they were crying. They had left wives, girlfriends, parents. And I remember at night saying, oh, those poor guys, man, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I was motivated. You ever, you ever been motivated about anything? You need to be motivated. You need to have hope. I had a lot of hope. I had the hope that this was it for me, that I had found my place in life, that I was going to make my family, my friends proud. I was going to do something for my country. I had a lot of hope and a lot of motivation. Well, I finished the training. We were on our way to Vietnam. Panama Canal Zone, Jungle Warfare School, helicopter accident. Damaged my shoulder very badly. Lost almost 50% of the use of my right shoulder permanently. They said the rest of my team went to the Central Highlands in Vietnam. I went to a hospital. I was crushed. I was crushed. Everything I'd worked for. Lost hope. I was deflated. Within 90 days, every last man was dead. My entire team. Every man. God's ways are not our ways. Well, I finished my tour in the Army. I went to Europe. Had a basically easy job. Was honorably discharged. Finished college. Went off to work in business. I thought, well, at least maybe I could have a respectable job. and make some money, went to Las Vegas as an accountant. <laughs> I did. Right out of college, 1973, I went, it was an exciting thing. I worked for a big CPA firm. All, we had a, a lot of big hotel casinos for clients, and we were the only two, my friend and I, were the only two non-Mormons in the firm. <laughs> and the Mormons were very, very good family people, good wholesome kind of people. Um, they did not want to put their men into casinos to work. They didn't mind taking the fees, <laughs> but they said, a couple Italians from New York, hey. <laughs> so we began doing the audition. I had the Las Vegas Hilton, the, La the Flamingo Hilton, the Tropicana. These were my clients. And I began to do well. I met all the movie stars, the rock stars. Um, it was exciting. I was mesmerized by it. I began to do better and better. And I thought, finally, I found it. I had hope again. Hope in my heart. It was great. I was motivated. Wonderful when, that, when you have that. Well, one thing led to another. I was hired by one of our clients, the Tropicana. I had a big position at the Tropicana. And then the governor appointed me to the Nevada Gaming Control Board. And that was very exciting. I, I did investigations all over the country on sources of funds into the casinos. I even went to foreign countries on investigations. And then the election came and the governor didn't get reelected and I didn't get reappointed. <laughs> and I was part of the unemployment statistics that year. But I didn't lose too much sleep over it. I picked myself right up and I went off to California where there was a second gold rush going on, real estate boom. So I thought I would use my knowledge of accounting and finance to try to make my fortune that way. And I about starved to death <laughs> for two years. But then 
it clicked. Now, I used to work hard. When you have hope, when you are motivated, you will work hard. I worked 12 to 18 hours a day, six, sometimes seven days a week. Finally, it had to pay off. And very quickly, I was very successful. I remember 1979, I was so successful, my accountant, even though I was an accountant, I had an accountant. After you start making money, even if you're an accountant, you've got to hire accountants. Because <laughs> once you have money, you've got to find, figure out a way to keep it. My accountant said, well, you, you, you made too much money, you've got to have a tax write-off. Uh, so I went out and bought a Ferrari. <laughs> a nice, shiny red one before Magnum P.I. <laughs> and I remember driving it down Rodeo, driving Beverly Hills, having thought that I had now arrived. Success. Man, the American dream. I had pursued the American dream and caught up with it. Well, one thing led to another. I began to get more and more prestigious clients, rock stars, movie stars, investing their money in real estate. I started to go to their parties. I had such high hopes. I brought my family out, showed them a good time, could afford to give my mother nice things. I began to be invited to places where people wanted to be invited, the jet set people, that is. I remember one night at a party in the Hollywood Hills. It was actually, it was Chevy Chase's birthday party. And John Bellucci was there that night for a little while. He wouldn't be alive much longer. But I saw him that night. And in the course of the party, a, a very beautiful young actress and I were talking. She's still around, and she's just very famous now. She's been around for a while. And after a while, she said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to introduce you to my best friend. And I thought, well, great, I always was interested in meeting another good-looking girl, so I said, okay. So we went to another part of this big mansion, and we're talking some more. And finally I said, where, where, where's your friend? When's your friend coming? And she said, oh, yeah, my friend. And she opened up her purse, took out a gold container, opened it up, the white powder in there, and she said, meet my best friend, cocaine. And then it began. Well, we all know how stupid it is. We all know how deadly it is. But it's so seductive. Boy on the way up from a small town, from a poor family, always wanted to be something or somebody. And now here he is with an actress known all over the country, although she was just starting out. She was gaining recognition very quickly, and here I am with her. And so, well, as the great statesman Conrad Adenauer once said, you know, God has placed obvious limitations on our intelligence, but none whatsoever on our stupidity. <laughs> And I have to say, that night was a prime example of it. And that's where it began. Oh, shortly thereafter, I was introduced to someone. Um, oh, there was a movie not too long ago. Had something to do with what's love got to do with it. And I was with the, um, the villain portrayed in that movie, who was never a villain to me. But uh, he, was, he was a well-known musician, Ike Turner. Ike and Tina Turner. 
and Ike needed to sell his recording studio. And I was a real estate broker. And so there began a business partnership that the first night deteriorated into a death wish. Oh, a lot of people came over that night. See, Ike had a, an apartment above the recording studio for parties. It was known all over Los Angeles and Hollywood. And there were several actresses, actors, rock stars, and the assistant district attorney who came over that night, all freebasing cocaine. A lady that I have the highest regard for wrote a book last year called Angel on My Shoulder. She was there. Matter of fact, that lady and I went through a lot of the same things, knew the same people, passed through the same crucible of fire and trial and suffering. Her name's Natalie Cole. And she's a very good Christian, by the way. Married to a minister, by the way. Her first husband was a preacher, by the way. She always liked preachers. <laughs> it went from bad to worse. It always does. And so the more of these people I met, the more partying I did, the less I worked. That's how it goes. And I began to lose my grip on everything, first and foremost, reality. I had acquired a net worth of several million dollars. Poor boy from the poor part of town in New York. Made it fast. In three years, lost it even faster. It ended up in a hospital, VA hospital, a VA psychiatric hospital. One year of my life, I do not have a clue if you know what that means. One year of my life, one entire year of my life, I spent in a psychiatric hospital alone very much alone. I had a lot of friends. I used to spend about $10,000 a week, by the way, on my habit. Of course, I didn't do that. My friends did. I did enough, but they did most of it. I lived in a million-dollar house on the beach, Ferrari, Mercedes, 60-foot Hatteras yacht, Notable people in and out of my house constantly, from rock stars to politicians. All of us doing the same thing. Getting high, losing hope. One year, I didn't eat the first 30 days I was in that hospital. Just wanted to die. See, they'd, they brought me in there half dead. The only person who ever came to visit me, other than one girlfriend for a little while, was my mother. All the rest of the rats jumped off the sinking ship. You can count on that. Well, my mother stuck by me. Funny thing about mothers, mothers don't desert their children's dads either. I remember the low point of it all. They had put me in an examination room and strapped me to a table and shot me up with Thorazine. That's a psychotropic drug, which actually had no effect on me. They found that out later. Didn't really have, but, but I'll tell you what it, did, what it did do. The experience about crushed me. I remember looking up at the ceiling 
in anguish. How could I be here? How could I be here? I had lost hope. See, I'd been losing my money and losing my hope over a period of about two to three years. And then I ended up there destitute. Physical health gone, emotional health gone. I hadn't had any spiritual health for a long time. Hadn't set foot in a church. Oh, by the time the smoke would clear, it'd be 20 years. Well, as I was in that room, a nurse came in. And the nurse just looked down and smiled at me, a rather vaguely familiar smile. One word came out of her mouth, Johnny. And she laughed. And I vaguely recalled somebody else many years before who had addressed me that way. Well, I eventually got out of that hospital, and I was homeless. I do not know how many of you in here have ever been homeless. I do not know how many of you in here have ever been multimillionaires and then homeless. But that's what happened to me. In the streets of Los Angeles, the clothes on my back, not a nickel to my name, no place to live, nothing to eat. And I was not a street person. I always thought I was a tough guy, but I was not a street person. I wouldn't go to soup kitchens. I wasn't one of them, after all, so I thought. I'd sleep in the park. And I remember stopping right in my track saying, what is this? The pain was so bad. What could this be? I was absolutely devoid of hope. No hope. Where there should have been the light of hope, there was the darkness of despair. Not a point of light anywhere to be found. Eventually, my mother got word to me. A little le letter was delivered by one of my friends found me. And my mom said, look, you've tried everything else. Why don't you just try saying a prayer? How about? Now, my mom had given up her preaching career many years before. I guess when I was about 18. She had given it up because it didn't work. Uh, <clears throat> you parents and grandparents have to learn something. Talk is cheap. And after a point, you're not going to get anywhere with it. But prayer is not. So although my mother had given up her, her preaching career, uh, she certainly uh, hadn't given up her praying career. She prayed the rosary every day, every day for 20 years. And my mother said, why don't you try saying a prayer? And she had enclosed a little prayer card in there. Picture the Blessed Mother on the back of that, the Hail Mary. And I grew up in a Catholic family, went to Catholic schools, and I had forgotten how to say the Hail Mary. And so I read it off the prayer card. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Once a day, not twice, not three times, once a day, no religious fanaticism for me. <laughs> well, a while later, another communique came from mom, this time said, why don't you come home? You're living out there in a very foolish way. It's dangerous. Come home. You'll have time to think. So my mom sent me a one-way ticket to go home. Mom's on stupid, you know. She didn't send me no round-trip ticket. <laughs> didn't send me any money, that's for sure. One-way ticket, and I went. And I got there, and things immediately went from bad to worse. I thought all hell was on my back. You see, the devil, in case any of you don't believe in the existence of Satan, you better start believing. Somebody, some smart guy, liberal theologian one time said to me, you ever seen him? And I said, without batting and not many times. 
and I am deadly serious. Oh, I can go into the street, and I can take an outright pagan out of the street. I can take a, a Hells Angels motorcycle guy high on methamphetamine who'd kill you as soon as look at you and ask him a serious question. You believe in the devil? He said, he said, you darn right I do. Sometimes they have more faith than we do. In any event, it was a good thing I went home. Now, my mother's house was a very small, poor, modest house. But my mother's little house had more holy water in it <laughs> than any five churches. My mother's house had more crucifixes and statues and pictures of the Blessed Mother. My, my, I want to tell you what, if the devil walked in there, he in trouble. <laughs> now, that was a good place for me to be. And so there I was, and I suffered, and he came at me. And the temptations to suicide, which I've had for years, were absolutely overpowering. It was terrible. I, it, it was such an oppression. I kept up that Hail Mary every day. That one Hail Mary a day turned into the rosary every day. One day, night I lay down on the edge of death, I'm sure. And I said to God, Lord, I don't even know if you're real, but if you are, you better help me and help me now because I can't go on. I had totally lost hope. That night I had an experience that I cannot explain and won't even try to. It's beyond my ability. Peace, deep, penetrating, all-encompassing, pervasive peace. I couldn't move. I was captured by peace. And when I was released from that beautiful peace early in the morning, I knew one thing. I knew God's name. It was an interior knowing. No preacher had preached it to me. I hadn't read it in a book. I knew it from the inside out. God's name is mercy. That's what I knew. God's name is mercy, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. I knew God loved me. Now look, just in case any of you are deluded, in case you are deluded, you think, oh, Father's a priest and a preacher. Let me tell you something. I was one of the worst characters. You definitely wouldn't want your daughter going out with me. I was bad, bad, bad. I was violent, drug addict, the bad, bad to the bone. Well, that morning, it changed. I went to my mother, and I announced to her as nonchalantly as a tough guy could, Mom, I'd like to go to confession. <laughs> and she tried to be just as nonchalant, and she said, the profound saying, oh. <laughs> yeah, but I ain't going around here. After all, I was a big time sinner, and I want to go someplace special. She said, not a problem. I know right where to take you. We went up in the shrine of the North American Martyrs, a couple hours from home, Oriesville, New York. It's a shrine the Jesuits run. It's the birthplace of Blessed uh, Catherine Tekakwitha. St. Isaac Job and René Goupil were martyred there. It's holy ground. And as I walked on the grounds, I knew I had to go to confession. You know, I grew up Catholic, even though I really didn't know much about my faith. I knew I had to go to confession. And I saw a priest coming, uh-oh. And I said, Father, I, I need to go to confession. And he was on his way to say Mass. He said, well, I can't hear your confession right now, but but down there on the front porch of the office is an elderly priest. He'll be glad to hear your confession. Go down and see him. So I did. 
And I began, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's 20 years since my last confession. And I made as good a confession as I could. And when I finished, the priest held up his hands and the most beautiful words that I ever heard came out of his mouth. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then as he finished, he looked at his watch and he said, amazing. This is amazing. He said, it's exactly 3 p.m., the hour of mercy. The exact hour Jesus died that you might come to this moment. Well, yeah, God's name is mercy. And he said, and there's something else. I don't quite know what it is, but I know there's something special here. I said, I know what it is, Father. He says, you do? I said, yep. He said, well, tell me. I said, okay. I said, I know I'm called to be a priest. <laughs> now, y'all got to understand, that man had just heard my 20-year confession. <laughs> Possibly had brain damage as a result of it. And I'll never forget it. He was sitting in a rocking chair, and he kind of shuddered, and she was real old. And he, and he said, well, 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 all things are possible with God. <laughs> well, that began a beautiful journey, a beautiful journey that would end, or I could say begin, some years later, at the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, 62 of us processed in. At the end of the line was Pope John Paul II. When my turn came, I knelt down before the successor of St. Peter. His hands came down on my head, and I remembered. I remembered where I had been. I had been through the valley of death. I had been through the valley of darkness and despair. I had lost hope. I was dead. But Jesus, who can raise the dead, had come after me in that dark valley where no hope lived. Afterwards, ordained a priest, we processed out and I was floating out, actually, I think. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a woman. Beautiful young woman, right behind where the cardinals were. And I, I vaguely recognized her. I couldn't stop or anything, and she smiled. A vaguely familiar smile, and I saw her lips move. The scent of lilacs filled St. Peter's Basilica. Later, I was thanking God, walking on the floor of the basilica, and a voice from the shadows, Psst, Father, could you hear my confession? And I remember thinking the profound theological thought, I can do that. <laughs> And he began, bless me, Father, for I have sinned 35 years since my last confession. And he made a beautiful confession, and wouldn't you know it, the most beautiful words yet had I ever heard came out of my own mouth. I absolve you. I absolve you from your sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then, a few years later, I was preaching in Florida. My dad came to hear me. Afterwards, he said, hey, I got to leave this morning. You got a minute for your old man? I said, sure, man. Thought he wanted to just have breakfast or something. He said, I'd like to go to confession. We went in the rectory. My dad knelt down before me, and I heard these words come out of my father's mouth. Bless me, father, for I have sinned. It is 50 years since my last confession. And he made a beautiful confession on his knees, and I celebrated Mass, and he received Jesus in tears. 
And he said to me, son, he said, I have been in the dungeon a very long time, but now I'm free. Now I'm free, free at last. Now I'm free. And I remember thinking, thank God, how good you are. How good God is. God's name is mercy. And every year that goes by, I am reminded that this great God, in preserving me as an extreme example, to use the words of St. Paul, in preserving me as an extreme example to give hope, to give hope to others. My brothers and sisters, if your children are on the verge of disaster, hope. Hope. Hope in the Lord, and you shall never hope in vain. God love you.